here is Las Vegas, the party capital of the world, or well, Sin City as it's better known, for the sheer volume of drinkers, gamblers, revelers and hookers that flock here every year. For decades, it's personified the true American dream, a place where anything is possible, but where money is king and greed is good. Then came the global recession, which swept through here like a financial tsunami. Now Vegas is fighting for its very existence. Can it survive and thrive again, or will it simply die at the altar of its own wheel of fortune? crunch almost broke the bank in Las Vegas. Since it started, three hotel casino companies have gone bust and tourism is way down. It'll take more than that to stop the superstars coming out to play. Oh wow. Look at that. <laughs> you naughty here? Me? Never. In a city where fortunes are won and lost, Vegas became ground zero for the worldwide property crisis. You've lost a million dollars on, right. and on yeah. one property. But there's an even bigger problem facing this desert city. It's running out of water. When does this dry out? We could be at critical, I'd call them catastrophic levels, in eight years. Come what may, though, Vegas can still make dreams come true. I give you this ring. It's a really big one. take a drive around the good times capital, it's hard to believe that so many hotels are in financial trouble. Instead, you're left wondering just how many billions have been spent building this city. 15 of the world's 20 largest, glitziest hotels lie along the four-mile Las Vegas Boulevard, more popularly known as the Strip. People from all over the world swarm here to drench themselves in the year-round sunshine and revel in an orgy of fantasy and excess. It's a city where you can sleep in a pyramid and eat in the Eiffel Tower. And even 24-carat gold-plated windows. Just what I'd expect from my old mucker Donald Trump. Well, how about this for over-the-top indulgence? The Hugh Hefner suite of the Palms. Now, this isn't the lobby. It's part of the two-story apartment you get for a mere $40,000 a night. Great if you can afford it. Old place to put a mirror, though. But for a natural athlete like myself, there's only one that really matters. The hardwood suite at the Palms. Included in your room is a basketball court. This is where the real action happens in Sin City. $25,000 a pop, it's not exactly a free throw, though. In 2007, gambling revenue was $12 billion a year. Over the summer of 2009, it was down more than 20%, or $2 billion, and that hurt. Yet this city was built on gambling and the promise of hitting the jackpot. Over the years, hordes of would-be winners flocked here, and in turn, the hotels have grown and grown. The original Caesars Palace had 680 rooms. Now it boasts 3,300, all booked by punters after one thing. They want to take one of these little things and turn it into one of these little things, because that is worth $2.5 million. In fact, the whole table is covered in $30 million. You know that old saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? Sod that for my soldiers. The casinos need really big spenders. The type who'll spend a few million on the spin of a wheel. They don't care if they're good looking or refined, they just have to bet big. They're known as whales, but when they do drift into town, Vegas pulls out all the stops. Hidden away in these service streets, 
lies a secret casino within a casino. It's called the Mansion, and it was built specifically to cater for the gambling tastes of multi-millionaires. I've been told that even by Vegas standards, this place is going to blow my mind. As a guest of the mansion with its 29 villas and 175 staff, you step out of the searing Vegas heat into a tranquil haven where even the garden is air-conditioned. What's more, it seems the richer you are, the more you get given, as everything is free. I mean, it is amazing. It's like, it's like I've been transported into, into Rome or somewhere, or Tuscany, you know? Oh, I'm very glad to hear that. So let me get this straight. I come in here. Yes. You give me an amazing apartment yes. with its own pool. I have seven or eight staff for me alone. Mm -hmm. I come and have caviar, lobster. Mm -hmm. I have $20,000 bottles of cognac, whatever I want. Yes. And I don't have to give you anything. You don't have to give me anything. Your play in the casino dictates how much more of luxury you would like to ah, have. So if I lost a lot of money, mm. would I get more luxury? If you're a good customer, we'll give everything that you want to make you happy. Hmm, so what makes a good customer, I wonder? I'm guessing it's not someone who spends $5 on a slot machine. To find out, I headed to the casino floor to meet the boss. If you don't mind me saying, you're not the caricature image I had of a, of a Vegas casino boss. You don't seem to be ugly, scar-faced, or potentially likely to shoot me. I'm not. I won't shoot you today or ever. <laughs> so, no, the, the, the typical boss is changing. More and more females and less of us have scars. Tell me about the psychology of these guys. I mean, uh, they're mainly men, I would guess. I think most are men, and I try to figure out the psychology because what would make someone risk that type of money? I think they're very competitive. Mm. I think they like the challenge. I, I just really do think it comes down to they want to beat you, and I don't really know that it ever is about the money. It's about the challenge. How, how rich are these guys? Really, what they start with can be easily $5 million, and that's just their gambling bankroll. Just, just in here? Just in here. So they'll stroll up, five million, off we go. Off we go. I heard that quite a few of the whales in the recession have been culled. I think the recession has definitely hurt business. There was a time when you would come in here on a Saturday and you'd see every game full, and that's certainly not the case today. I'm going to have a little go at this. You're going to play? All right. Um, I'm going to bet $100,000 on my first hand. OK. And All I'll right. put 100000 on here as well. OK. Good luck. You don't really mean that, do you? Absolutely. 17, that's... 17, well, I'd hold that, right? I yeah. would. And on the other one, I need a card, right? A card. You're up to nine, you're gonna go again? Yep. 11, you're in good yep. shape. 15, think about it. I am thinking about it. What should I be thinking, Billy? I would think stand. You have to look at this Against one. the three. Yeah? I would. Okay, I'll He's take your advice. He's okay. supposed to bust. Okay. I am supposed to. And I did. Hey! Well, so I've just won 200 grand. Let's just up the ante a bit here. I think that's 400,000 on each. Good luck, Tim, because... Good luck to you. This could be the moment. This could be it. Rather like next door, where the whale comes home to roost. Oh, God! This is what happens, isn't it? That was just arrogance, wasn't it, on my part? So, come on, 200 on each. Two on each. I didn't come here to be cowardly. I came here to clean you out. Uh, hold. Yes. And I'll have a card. Let's go. It's horrible how quick this happens. 21. God almighty. 21. Great. I've only known you about half an hour, but I already want to kill you. And we have a <laughs> check for your design in the amount of <laughs> Right, so that took about 90 seconds to lose $1 million. Yes, it did. Thank you, Tim. Really enjoyed my day with it. All right. Thank I you, Debbie. See you again. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Debbie. <laughs> When a casino can win a million dollars in just 90 seconds, you can see why they're prepared to make their guests very welcome indeed. It really is all about indulgence in Vegas. Yes, it's flashy and even cliched, but that's part of the allure of a place in which anything goes. And with Hollywood a mere stretched limo drive away, you never know who you're going to come across next. I mean, I can think of all sorts of things I've always wanted to do. Dreams that might come true. And you know what? In Vegas, they do. Right, Paris? Mm-hmm. Vegas rocks. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of Vegas? 
I love Vegas. I've been coming here my whole life, ever since I was two years old. So for every New Year's, we come with my family, and it's just like Disneyland for adults. You can gamble, you can go and just do anything here. It's crazy. You naughty here? Me? Never. It's Paris. You can tell me. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> I met a guy who runs one of the big casinos who told me that he recently gave you $250,000 to just turn up to a party. What do you have to do for that? Host the party, maybe get on the mic, say what's up to everyone, and dance the night away. I got 500 for New Year's last year. $500,000? Mm hmm What did you say there? Happy New Year! <laughs> Tell me about the Vegas business machine, because you are a smart little cookie. I mean, I've always said to people, I've interviewed you before, and this whole... <laughs> that is an act, right? Yeah, it is. It's kind of just a character I play. And when I'm in a business meeting, I'm a completely different person. But when I'm on, you know, my reality television shows, just from doing this simple life, I just started doing this kind of character, the baby voice, and kind of acting ditzy. But... The whole dumb blonde shtick. Yeah, but it's not me. How much are you worth? I don't know. I mean, you are stinking rich. Well, I have 15 different licensees and brands, and... Just came out with my ninth fragrance, and I... Do you think you're talented? Yes. At what? At everything I do. I mean, I'm a talent show judge, so I'm, I'm trying to get to the center of your brand here. It's just about being myself and having a good time, and I'm a good singer. Well, it's been lovely getting to know you again, Paris. Me too. I'm feeling a bit of a chemistry, aren't you? You are still signal, right? I'm not married yet. <laughs> Am I going to see you again while I'm in Las Vegas? You play your cards right, Paris. Who knows what may happen? So Vegas was built to make fantasy become reality. But just how far will casinos go to get your money? You want mug punters, right? I want losers. And I get some straight talking from a Vegas legend. Anytime you want to hook her, there she is. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just great. Since the first gambling hall opened in the 30s, Las Vegas has always been a place with a unique selling point. Gambling, drinking and titillation all became part of an acceptable good time trip, with a strict proviso that what goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. It could be the most successful city slogan ever, a passport to do whatever you like, whenever you like, to be naughty and to get away with it. It's not even 7 p.m. and that's the hard rock pool where the partying has been going on for about 10 hours. I've got to be honest with you, I find that kind of non-stop orgy of self-indulgence really quite disgraceful. Evening, ladies. Evening, Piers. But the credit crunch means casinos are fighting hard to attract the big gamblers. They employ casino hosts whose job it is to dangle all kinds of carrots in front of the high rollers and no one dangles bigger ones than the hard rock Steve Sear. Steve, here we are in the presidential high roller suite at the hard rock. This spectacle to my left of the lovely ladies in the jacuzzi, two more playing the 10-pin bowling. Is this kind of normal for this suite, would you say? Definitely. It's a standard operating procedure at the hard rock. This table, for instance, that used to be a glass top, we've had to make it granite because the girls and the, the dancers kept cracking it all the time. Now, I'm told that in a city full of whales, you are the chief harpoonist. Wow. Well, How do you plead? Uh, guilty as charged. <laughs> uh, How do you do it? I try not to do anything morally wrong, but um, if I happen to be at the airport and uh, I'm in a limo and they think they're going to Caesars and we end up at the Hard Rock, that's been fun. And I'm like a Jerry Maguire. I make the deal. Um, how much am I going to give the girlfriend shopping? Maybe your betting limits? If you lose a million dollars, you only have to pay me eight fifty. Why? Because I'm going to discount that to get you in. And it's egos. I I'm an ego feeder. Tell me how you would feed my ego. I want tubs of caviar all over my suite. Easy. Look, all that stuff is fluff, smoke and mirrors. It's like well, maybe to you, mate. I mean, this is beluga caviar, pots of it. Right. You know what? It's kind of like, let's look at the simple level. A UFC fights in town. You want to sit front row. You could buy that online for probably a thousand bucks, but I'm going to get you to risk a hundred thousand so you can walk in and sit in the front row. You want mug punters, right? I want losers. <laughs> I want losers. Here's my goal, Mr. M. A guy loses a hundred thousand, shakes my hand and said, God, I had a great time. When's the next event? 
It's the cost of entertainment. Some people want to go around the world, some people want to go to Hawaii, some people want to risk money gambling. But in the current climate, the punters weren't the only ones who got caught taking the risks. The Vegas of today was built on the back of major corporate investment. Hotel owners borrowed billions to erect the city of dreams, now numbering almost 150,000 rooms, rooms that need to be filled. When the credit crunch hit, people no longer flocked here, and hotels had no choice but to slash their rates. Confidence began to crumble, and the city that was used to winning found itself suddenly staring defeat in the face. All over Las Vegas, there are whopping great big building sites like this one, the Fontainebleau Las Vegas Hotel. It's a three and a half billion dollar project, but it's ground to a halt because in June 2009, it went bankrupt. It couldn't find the last $770 million. Just down the road there is the Echelon Resort. Five billion dollars worth of planning was just ground to a halt as well. Even the great MGM Mirage narrowly avoided bankruptcy by selling off assets and floating his Far East arm on the stock market. And get this, the owner of the Sands Corporation and the Venetian is said to have personally lost a staggering $19 billion. It's been savage, as fellow Brit and founder of Planet Hollywood, Robert Earl, knows only too well. What we've got here is we're now going up to 100,000 square feet of gaming. Wow. Robbers to spend $700 million on the addition of the brand new PH Towers, a 52-story luxury hotel and apartments. Despite the fact that debts on his present hotel swelled $860 million. How much gets gambled on an average night here? Oh, I can't give you those numbers. No I'd numbers? have to kill you afterwards. <laughs> this just pumps 24 hours a day, 24 hours. seven days a week. Seven days a week. All year long. Right, and you're on the Las Vegas Strip. You are in absolutely the nerve center. In terms of pure economics, Robert, I mean, you've got a massive complex here. You employ 3,000 people, there are 4,000 rooms. Yep. What does it cost to run a place like Bunny Hollywood? Generally, you're looking at a million dollars a day. A day? Yeah. Wow. We've heard lots about the economic crisis enveloping Vegas. How bad has it been in reality? Dreadful. Uh, it's been an unmitigated disaster. It's caused most companies to look at their lending structure and see what they can do. It, it came almost overnight. It came because uh, businesses cancelled their trips. It came because holiday makers cancelled their holiday because they had trouble paying their mortgage. America reacts to everything very, very quickly. Normally, there's this feeling that the casino always wins. At the moment, probably for the only time in the history of Vegas, the casinos aren't winning, are they? Well, in the old, old days when you were in your nappy, the business was about free food, free rooms, cheap entertainment and gambling. Over the last 10 years, it's transformed and it's now a third entertainment, a third rooms and a third gaming. The current crisis has started to revert the place to the old days. So now people are giving away the rooms. People are giving away the food. Should we feel sorry? No. <laughs> Will you show any mercy when the good times roll back? No. <laughs> Do you love Straight being here, back. Robert? Yes. <laughs> Straight back to the jugular. <laughs> Straight talking and going for the jugular are also the trademarks of one of this city's star performers. Joan Rivers first hit the Vegas Strip 40 years ago. It's my dog, Spike. Yeah. Yeah. He's anorexic. When I first came to Vegas, you drove down the Strip and there was Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis, Dean Martin, Anne Margaret, Elvis Presley, Barbra Streisand. It was astonishing. So it was kind of the holy grail yeah. of entertainment. And that's when you knew you were a big star. What is it that's special about Vegas for entertainers? It, there's such energy. Mm. Well, it's incredible energy, isn't it? Everywhere yeah. you go, 24-7. Oh, any time you want a hooker, there she is. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just great. It's like coming to a giant cocktail party. You go, oh, Bet's here. Oh, Elton's here. So you all meet after your shows. What is the greatest single performance you've ever seen in Vegas by anybody? Sinatra 
for the simplicity. Did you ever see him? No. He, I don't. I do the same thing. He because I learned he didn't get an ounce. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the world's great. No, 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 no. He just would walk out. Mm. And he once said to me, if they don't know why they came, <laughs> they shouldn't be. Bright light said it gonna set my soul, gonna set my soul on Well, they first came in 1905, when this place was a desert railroad outpost. By the 1950s, Las Vegas, Nevada had captured the world's imagination as the fun destination, a kind of grown-up Disneyland. People have always come for the glamour, the gambling, and to take advantage of Nevada's liberal marriage and divorce laws. Ah, yes, and for something else. <laughs> Topless girls first debuted on the strip in 1956, and as Joan Rivers hinted, sex still sells, but it's look, don't touch. Well, that's the theory, anyway. Sin City has the world's biggest strip clubs, but prostitution is illegal. You wouldn't know it, though, as 10,000 hookers are believed to be working outside the law. One man who embraces the very image of Sin City is its mayor, Oscar Goodman. Like Vegas, he's loud, showy, and not to be messed with. He was once a criminal attorney for the mob. Hi, Peter. Hey, Goodman, how are you? The Lord Mayor to you, please. <laughs> How are you? I'm very well. Welcome what, to, what an, oh, it's an welcome office. Welcome to like Las a, Vegas. This is an empire. Now, you are the most popular mayor in the history of Las Vegas. In the history of the world. <laughs> How have you done it, Oscar? I mean, what is oh, your Oh, just secret? myself. You know, uh, I haven't changed my habits. I like to drink. Excellent. And I uh, love to gamble with both fists. I'll bet on a cockroach as to which way it's going to move. <laughs> so that's me. I can't help myself. Let's talk about Vegas for a moment. Obviously, it's no secret that Vegas is going through a bit of a rough patch with the recession. Some, of, uh, some parts of, are having difficulty. Our basic premise is very sound here. Uh, the, we are the tourist destination of the world. We've got the uh, most beautiful hotels. We've got the greatest shows in the world. So we have to come back. It's, it's inevitable because people need Vegas. They need a place where they're able to really enjoy themselves. They're able to go to the cusp of legality. You're quite a controversial mayor. Not me. You did suggest you might remove the fingertips of graffiti artists. No, the thumb. Oh, the thumb. <laughs> I mean, that's what uh, I, I understand. That's what distinguishes us from good. other primates. I haven't seen any Picassos out there, OK? <laughs> if, I saw, if I saw a Picasso, I might say there's some artistic form there. But these are punks, off of the thumb. You are a lawyer. Uh, I am a lawyer by profession. I used to represent all the reputed mobsters around here, so I have an idea of well, what actually, the old I was, bit, I was a bit concerned about that. Well, you have every reason to be concerned <laughs> if you keep on questioning me the way you are. <laughs> I mean, look, how does this go? If this interview goes badly, I mean... You may get whacked. <laughs> to be serious, you would like to legalize prostitution? No, I, I think that um, uh, anybody who says they don't want to discuss it, uh, they're either an ostrich or uh, ignorant, the way I see it. Women are being degraded right now, if we're going to be perfectly honest. There's no monetary benefit to uh, society as a result of their activity, which is extant. But it sounds to me, Oscar, like you're, you're presenting an argument for legalizing it. Well, uh, but on the other hand, I recognize that there's a moral aspect, a religious aspect, and uh, uh, a, a feminist aspect to it. I would argue to you that there is a form of legalized prostitution already here in Vegas. Let me show you something. I picked these up earlier. I walked down the strip, right. and I collected these. You right. dirty old man. They're you. not the conventional playing You dirty cards. old man. Now, what are these? What are these? I assume they're very pretty girls, that's for sure. <laughs> but uh, I, I assume that uh, they're uh, ads uh, for young ladies to uh, 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 be escorts. So why aren't the people that do this being arrested? Oh, many of them are. They're everywhere. They're all down the strip. Uh, well, uh, in America, thank God, there's such a thing as free speech. And unless it's uh, obscene, uh, or pornographic, uh, it, it is protected. If you're a Brit watching this, Oscar, should they see it as Sin City? I hope so. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, the one thing, no, I'm, I'm very serious. We have that mystique that no other place has, the mystique of the mob, uh, our founding fathers. And I don't want to lose that. But to have a good time, uh, to uh, let your inhibitions uh, uh, take you over, uh, I think that's great. Busy having a very good time is one of the worst gamblers Vegas has ever seen. Oh, it's red. A lucky flight. Come to Daddy. Unbelievable. <laughs> and the odds on Vegas' future aren't looking too good either. The water's running out. When does this dry up? 
we could be at critical, I'd call them catastrophic levels, in eight years. A couple of years ago, Vegas was the fastest growing city in America. 50,000 people a year moved here as property and land prices exploded. It was a land of milk and honey, but whatever background you came from, you could still strike it rich. But then came the credit crunch. The casinos hit problems, they shed jobs, the dream soured. Very quickly, Vegas became the fastest again, only this time the foreclosures. It was the ground zero of the worldwide property crash. In just three years, unemployment tripled to almost 14%. Hastily abandoned properties lie dormant everywhere. The electricity cut off and the once lush lawns dying. Even whole shopping centers lie empty, like eerie ghost towns. The mistakes of the casino owners were made on a smaller scale by thousands of Nevadan homeowners. They simply borrowed too much. In fact, added together, all the losses are estimated to total $330 billion of America's banking debt. One of the area's hardest hit was Lake Las Vegas. We're only 20 minutes away from the Las Vegas Strip here, yet it couldn't feel more different. There's a serene man-made lake, the stunning Ritz-Carlton resort with its own private beach. This place was conceived as a kind of symbol of success, but it's become more of a monument to the recession. Let me tell you why. Some of those properties over there across the water were trading at $8 million each this time last year at the height of the boom. Now you could pick one up for just over 50% of that. It's become happy hour. And if you're in the mood for a bargain, well, just buy one, get one free. 10 miles away in the area of Rhodes Ranch, I'm meeting Mark McGarry, a Brit who came to Vegas 20 years ago. As a mortgage broker, he thought he'd hit the jackpot when he began buying and selling houses for his own portfolio. You got some great parties in there. Did you? Yeah, I really did, yeah. Now he and his family have been forced into rented accommodation while they try to sell the home they built from scratch. When you were doing well here, how well were you doing? About four years ago, we actually made nearly a million dollars. And you were selling mortgages? Yeah. Ironically? Yeah. In the property gold rush in Vegas, what was it like? Well, between mortgage agents and realtors, there's, there was nearly 50,000 people out there making money. 50,000 people in the property game in Vegas yeah. out of 2 million, all making loads yeah, of money on property. You, you, you couldn't go wrong. And how did you spend it? We bought six houses and their cars. At the peak of the market, you bought this place for how much? A million dollars. One million dollars. What do you think it's worth now? Um, <clears throat> I'd say about 550. Nearly half price yeah. in a year. In a year. Yeah. And at one point, it was worth 1.4. Yeah, it actually went up to 1.4 million. So you've lost a million dollars on this place. And on yeah. one property. What's this been like for you? Um, it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. You know, we watched this be built from concrete up. I picked everything in the house. I've had the kids' rooms done. I mean, it was, it was hard, but we knew that the how did, I mean, how does it make you feel to be standing in here now? Because this really was the dream home. Yeah, this is where I've raised my kids. But it's on its way back, you know? Just got to keep working and keep ploughing ahead. You'll get it back when you might. We will definitely get it back, yeah. He'll bring you back in there. I've got a funny feeling about Mark. <laughs> He's like, I know a few people like him in the casinos. Yeah. <laughs> Whilst both homeowners and casino owners have lost millions, their financial problems are nonetheless dwarfed by an even bigger and more pressing issue. 35 miles outside the city are the signs of a cataclysmic disaster. Nevada gets just four inches of rain a year on average, making it one of the driest places in North America. It's some bright spark of the brilliant idea of building a city here for two million people. The only way that those people exist is because of this, the world famous Hoover Dam. The Hoover Dam channels water from the Colorado River into Nevada, Arizona and California. Without the dam and Lake Mead, its man-made reservoir, no one in the surrounding area, and we're talking thousands of miles here, could survive. It's 500 feet deep and 110 miles long. But due to global warming, it's only 42% full. Nine years ago, I'd have been leaning over here, doing a spot of fishing off this pier. 
and the remaining water is receding fast. Most scientific experts claim this could all be gone within a decade. And if Lake Mead goes, then so does Las Vegas. It's a massive problem, and charge of the task of sorting it out is Pat Mulroy of the Southern Nevada Water Authority. How much water that Las Vegas uses comes from here? 90% of all of Southern Nevada's water comes from right here. Right, so Vegas basically survives in terms of water on this. Absolutely, and that's why this is such a frightening sight to us. When we look at these cliffs here, Pat, the white cliffs there, what does that signify? The uh, top of the white cliff is where the water line was in 1999. Wow, 10 years ago. 10 years ago. So in 10 years, it's dropped how far? 120 feet. So at this rate, when does this dry up? If the drought continues the way it's been progressing over the last decade, in two years, shortages will start being declared and the users will start getting cut back. In four years, we'll lose our upper intake and Hoover Dam will stop generating electricity, which is a frightening thought in the desert southwest. And if it continues, we could be at critical, I'd call them catastrophic levels in eight years, seven, eight years. My natural inclination, is because it's more fun that way, is to always blame the greedy casino bosses. Are they to blame with their massive developments, with oh, all no. these thousands of new rooms? Is that anything to do with this? No. So, we here in Nevada, we have 2% um, of the entire flows of the Colorado River for our disposal, for our use, of, every, of all the water that's in the system. So a minuscule amount. A minuscule amount. And of that, the Las Vegas Strip uses 3%. Of the 2%. Of the 2%. So actually, Vegas is almost an irrelevance in terms of consumption. Correct. But what is much more relevant is the importance of this to Vegas. That's the point. So Vegas is not to blame for this, but Vegas could be the big victim. Absolutely. We're the canary in the mine shaft of wow. climate change. Or possibly the elephant in the room. But there is hope. Channeling groundwater from basins in eastern Nevada is seen as a potential solution. But it's expected to take nine years to complete cutting it fine to say the least it sounds to me like vegas is putting all its money on the red of you pat <laughs> i hope not i hope they put it on the water <laughs> supply <laughs>so gambling revenue is down tourism on the slide and the water's running out but vegas isn't about to throw in the towel Historically, it's always been a bold city, a survivor that swum against the tide, even if now there isn't much of a tide left. And in this macho fighting spirit, could be summed up in one personality. It would surely have to be this one. My baby. Incredibly, Sylvester Stallone is still making hit movies nearly 35 years after he burst on the scene with Rocky. His latest film, The Expendables, features all his old mates, from Arnold Schwarzenegger to Bruce Willis and Jason Statham, and is said to be the action blockbuster of the year. Are you crazy? Could have killed me! You're welcome! But when Sly is not working hard on set, he likes nothing better than jetting over to Vegas. <laughs> In your prime, when you were a young man coming to Vegas, what would a Sly Stallone night involve? Probably sleeping all day long, kind of getting on, you know, the Dracula diet. You know, you sleep all day, up all night, and then we go to a fight. Usually you sit ringside, and Muhammad Ali or Ken Norton or Roberto Duran, and I would go in a white disco suit, the <laughs> collar open up, chains. I was, it's embarrassing. <laughs> and then we would hit all these raucous places, and then you finally crash at about five in the morning, you wake up about noon, you look in the mirror and you see your grandfather. <laughs> and you go, what happened? Who stole my face? This came 24 hours? What was the single greatest party you've ever had in Vegas, would you say? Oh, uh, probably uh, my birthday party, which was, uh, my wife threw it, and it was so, so many celebrities and people that I never thought I could get together in one room. You had Arnold and Bruce and Travolta and Tom Jones and... How old, which, which one was it? Which birthday? Oh, <laughs> something with a six on it. 60. <laughs> You're not 60, Sly, are you? Please, 62. You don't look a day over 40. Yeah, I don't look a day over 61. <laughs>
Is it the ultimate party place, do you think? Yeah. You know, they say that New York is this uh, the heartthrob and the most exciting city in the world, but the most fun city, period, is Vegas. So I'm going to have a little whack on 16. Sly is a backer of Planet Hollywood and is very much at home in a casino, but he has a reputation for being a lousy gambler. A bit rocky, you might say. Oh, it's right. Unlucky, Sly. Come to Daddy. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I sit at your table. You'll walk out of your underwear. It'll just, it's terrible. Vegas is going through a few problems at the moment. Would it be a great tragedy, do you think, if, if Vegas was to end as we know it? Oh, my God. Talk about universal mourning. <laughs> this is, everybody's sitting with a candle going, we were the world. Oh, my God. I, yeah. You got trillions of people that would, where would they go? Probably all come to our house. Yeah. Your house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put everything on red, right? I want to see if you can change your winning streak, finally. This is your last chance, Sly. Come on. This is where Rocky meets his maker. You better get a running start. Yes! Pow! You're the man. <laughs> this is the one that takes protects me. I don't me. know how to break this to you, but I've taken him to the cleaners on the roulette wheel. It's unbelievable. His Jennifer. losing streak has you know, continued. Well, now I'm, I'm the lucky it's one. True. Okay, you are. Now, look. Okay. Give the lady some chips. No, don't do it. Put it, put it all on either colour and see if you are the lucky one. All right, all on black, right? The whole right? Stallone reputation in casinos rests on this If hand. she wins, I'm divorcing her. Come on, black. Come on, black. Come on, black. Oh, yes! 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 Sly. What a revolting development this is. <laughs> Look at baby. Even Look your right. wife's a better gambler than you. I, I told you that. You are the I, worst gambler I've ever exactly. seen. Exactly. No, I'm the best because hire me and do exactly the opposite. <laughs> and you'll be a rich, rich person. <laughs> but there's one man who's hit the jackpot without risking a cent. You are the hundred million dollar man. That's what they're saying. And while the city struggles, could putting on a brand new face be the way forward for Vegas? This is an eight and a half billion dollar game. The world's largest slot machine jackpot was won here in Vegas. $39 million on the pull of a handle. I'm sure that will have solved any debt problems the lucky winner may have had. But if this city is to survive the recession and transform its future, it's going to need a lot more than luck. It's the entertainers who are now bringing in the big bucks. The likes of Bette Midler, Elton John and Cher are raking in more cash for the city than gambling. Celine Dion's stint at Caesars raised $400 million alone. Amazing on so many levels. Take a drive down the strip and one face pops up an awful lot. The winner of America's Got Talent and the winner of $1 million is... Terry Fader! Once a jobbing ventriloquist, Terry's life has been transformed with the signing of a huge contract to perform at MGM Mirage. But it's true, so true. I love you even more. Hello. Hey! <laughs> Playing games! How are you doing? Terry Fader. Nice How are you? I'm doing great. Lovely to see you. Terry, I mean, I've basically come here for one reason. I want my cut of the money. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I appreciate what you did to help me get here. I do, but you're not getting any. <laughs> no, I didn't think so. I didn't think so. Let's cut to the quick. What was the deal you signed? Well, I'm not supposed to talk numbers. I know it's vulgar. I, it's, well, but there are I, millions <laughs> of Britons watching this now who just want to feel sickened about what happened next, as well, much as I, I just, do. I'm not allowed to talk numbers. You can talk numbers if you want. I believe, because I was in Vegas at the time, yes. and I believe we were talking $20 million a year for five years, which, unless my maths is failing me, Terry, means <laughs> you are the $100 million man. I, it's, I, I would, I, that's what they're saying. I mean, I heard that's the biggest deal on the strip, that you are, you are the biggest star. There's never been a ventriloquist that headlined in Las Vegas, ever. I'm the very first, and they were terrified, but it turned out to be great. You know, a, at least 1,000 people a night. When what, what are they paying the tickets, uh, on average? Uh, here? Yeah. I, I think it's uh, between 80 and 130 oh. uh, per ticket. I'm it's, doing the math here. I mean, if you've got about 1,200 people paying an average of $100 each a night, 
five times a week. This is big money coming in. They're making big money despite the absolutely enormous check they've given you. <laughs> Vegas has always wanted your money. But now it wants you to spend it on shows, on partying, in its new nightclubs, eating in one of its 17 Michelin starred restaurants, or shopping in one of its frankly enormous malls. You see, Vegas is becoming a new city, one with a very small G for gambling. And they're aiming to kick things off with a bang. The Ball Casino has imploded to make space for MGM's city centre, billed as the future of Las Vegas. It's the largest privately funded development America's ever seen, with 6,000 new hotel rooms and residential and entertainment space designed by eight of the world's foremost architects, including our very own Sir Norman Foster. Conceived before the recession at a cost of $8.5 billion, its success or failure could make or break Vegas. Though, to be honest, it's already come mighty close to breaking MGM Mirage, as its chief executive, Jim Murren, knows only too well. There was a time a couple months ago where you'd look up here and you'd see helicopters overhead wanting to film a Chapter 11 filing of City Center, and that was extraordinarily trustful. How stressful. close did you come to that? Two hours. Seriously? Two hours. Two hours from effective bankruptcy. Uh, bankruptcy of this project, two hours. If not for our banks uh, to allow me to lend, borrow money from MGM and to put in this project when it was not fully financed, if the banks didn't say yes, this would have gone chapter and 9,000 people would be out of work right now. And that was uh, in April. When that call came through from the banks, you're in the party capital of the world, did you yeah. throw a bit of a celebration that night? I was played out, dude. You know, I was, <laughs> I was too tired. That was a Friday. I, I did have a couple cocktails, I could, I, could, uh, I could tell you that. You'll find no fake European landmarks here, though. Instead, a real $8 million Henry Moore sculpture. Wow. That's a classic Henry Moore, isn't it? It sure is. And most astonishing of all, the 76-acre site has just one small casino. A casino that sits in that building is smaller than the casino at Bellagio. Right. So, I mean, this is So a... your emphasis with City Center is very much moving away from gambling as the main selling point to shopping, hotels, restaurants, lifestyle, entertainment. Absolutely. And not shopping in a mall. I mean, do we need another mall? We're trying to evolve this city into a far more interesting hospitality market. It'd be a little bit more relevant on the, on the national and on the international stage than we have been. And what you're really saying is that the sin is slowly but surely coming out of Sin City. Yes, we believe that that myopic, one-dimensional view of Las Vegas is yesterday's news. This is an eight and a half billion dollar gamble. If it fails, what happens to you? I'm back to Connecticut. <laughs> They're getting rid of me. <laughs> There'll be somebody else here. <laughs> well, it's better than the old days where you'd just been found on yeah, the bottom exactly. of the floorboards. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'll be part of the foundation over there. <laughs> so is the party over for Las Vegas, or has it just begun? Only time and the sales figures will tell, as right now it's still drowning in debt. But Vegas has grown up. It's taking itself more seriously, and as we've seen, it has a plan for the future. But Sin City without as much sin, it's a hell of a gamble. But hey, we are in Las Vegas. Yes, that's right, we're in Las Vegas, and I know technically we're here on business, but I think we can all fit a little pleasure in as well. I just promise not to put it on expenses. When the moon hits your eye like a bigger pizza pie, that's amore. Britney did it, so did Angelina and Bob Geldof, along with almost 90,000 others a year who come to Tyver Knot in Vegas. It costs just $300 and it's all over in 15 minutes. Now that's my kind of romance. To you, here's Morgan. Paris Hilton, to be your wedded wife. I do. And you, Paris Hilton, take Piers Morgan, to be your lawfully wedded husband. I do. I give you this ring. Nice. It's a really big one. 
I give you this ring as a symbol, as a symbol of my love and commitment. Of my love and commitment. I give you this ring. I give you this ring as a symbol, as a symbol of my love and commitment. Of my love and commitment. By the power vested in me by the laws of this state, I do now pronounce you husband and wife. Here's you may kiss your wife. Thank you. Remember, Piers, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, <laughs> but I'm keeping the ring. Only in Vegas. Well, is it a poor man's Saint Tropez or a place in the sun for multimillionaires? Piers gets under the skin of Marbella when he's back on the 12th of January. Here in a moment, catch all the FA Cup action from today. The highlights on the way after the news next.